Hello, I'm Simon Whistler, you're watching Top 10's Net, and in the video today we're looking at the top 10 ways that your image of the samurai is wrong. Number 10. Skill in archery was more prized than skill with a sword. Samurais are the iconic warriors of Japan's past, and as they have been mythologized around the world, they have also been constantly associated with the katana. It is an incredibly popular weapon around the world, and many kids think of sword fighting with the iconic weapon to be one of the ultimate tests of skill. Many people are under the impression that samurai fought most of their battles with a sword and prized their ability to beat people in honor duels with katanas over other skills. Recently, however, in an Olympic interview, a Japanese contender in the archery competition explained that in Japan's past, archery had been much more prized than skill with a sword. This actually makes perfect sense, as long-ranged combat will always be better than close-ranged melee. Samurai would rain arrows down on their foes from a distance, shooting them at an up angle to get their proper range and damage that they wanted. This skill was considered far more important than sword fighting as that was the last resort if ranged battle had already failed. Of course, a samurai would train in all skills, but being able to properly hit a target from a long distance was more important than being able to hurt someone with your sword. If you were able to talk to an ancient samurai so fervently about the importance of the katana, he would probably be very confused. Number 9. The Bushido Code, as most people know it, is a modern invention. The complex, never-changing history of the Bushido Code is far too long to explain in a single video, but there are some clear misconceptions about it that are important to clear up. The code itself has been mythologized over the years and twisted for many different purposes, and this has led to many people, especially those in the Western world, with a completely confused picture of what it was supposed to be. While we don't know the exact details, as much of that has been lost to time and propaganda, many people believe the original code was once more militaristic, and while it certainly had some noble principles, they were not nearly as based on modern ideas of Western chivalry as the code we know today. There is strong evidence that most of what we know about Bushido comes from a book that was published at the turn of the 1800s, and it was clearly written in a way that was meant to appeal to Western philosophy. This confusion, however, also caused people within Japan to get an improper idea of what Bushido was, making the entire subject harder to understand. Japanese people have never had a clear picture themselves due to all the changes to the code. For example, over time it was revised so that what was originally loyalty to one's lord became loyalty to the emperor, and then in later years to Japan itself. There is also reason to believe that the code has been changed many times throughout Japanese history by various rulers and leaders whenever it suited their convenience. It was also used as a propaganda tool both to better control samurai behavior and also to better control the mythos of the samurai in the minds of the people. The history of the Bushido Code is so confused and purposefully twisted that we may never have the full truth of the matter, or even anything close to it. Number 8. The Ancient Samurai Used Other Sword-Like Weapons most people assume that when the samurai went into battle, they charged in with their katanas and cut their enemies to pieces in droves. While we already explained that samurai would first start by raining arrows down upon their enemies, most would think that when the battle got really down to the nitty-gritty, then the katanas would come out. However, in serious engagements, just like in historical European battles, when it came time for large amounts of people to face off in melee combat, spear-like weapons were the first line of attack and defense. In particular, the ancient Japanese had a weapon that was a cross between a sword and a gigantic spear. It consisted of a long shaft with a sword-like blade at the end. While the blade was smaller than a sword, it was larger than a typical spearhead, and provided more ability to slash and parry than a typical spear, which is better suited for throwing and jabbing attacks. These were common weapons for foot soldiers as they could provide distance between a group of soldiers and the enemy, provide a strong wall of defense as well as do serious damage. In a frantic melee battle, the weapon like a katana with shorter range and a larger, more brittle blade would not be as practical of a choice. Katanas certainly had their uses, but they would likely not be a particularly common weapon in a large-scale engagement on a battlefield. Number 7. Samurai Sometimes Used Crude Flintlock Rifles while it may already surprise some people that samurai relied more on bows and spears than their famous katanas, most people would still be convinced that someone in full samurai regalia would never be using weapons that could be considered more high-tech. 
certainly doesn't fit with the mythology that most people have of the time period. However, people were experimenting with guns several hundred years before they were as popular or as prevalent as they are now, and Japan was no exception. In the mid-1500s, guns were introduced to Japan and they started experimenting with crude flintlock rifles. The guns were not particularly amazing pieces of technology, but Japan wanted to be on the cutting edge, and while trying them out, it produced somewhere around 300,000 of them in the few decades after they were introduced. The Japanese quickly started using rifles constantly, despite them arguably not being as good as other weapons due to how primitive gun technology was at the time. Guns quickly became decisive in many important battles and became a fairly important part of warfare. There were not nearly as many large-scale battles, and guns were simply not the most practical option, so they fell out of standard use for a few hundred years. However, the Japanese never forgot the craft. Even during this period of low gun use, historians estimate that there were hundreds of active gunsmiths in the country. Number 6. Samurai were used as tax collectors we have mentioned before that the governments of Japan throughout the years, whether it was the modern government, an emperor, or various feudal systems, have all subverted the Bushido Code as well as the philosophy and the entire existence of the samurai as they have seen fit to fulfill whatever purpose they thought they needed. While most people are under the impression that these purposes were always to be sent in some way into battle or to go fight the enemies of Japan, this wasn't always the case. Samurai were almost always high-ranking noble Japanese of birth before they ever became samurai. It was natural that these same people were usually high up within the government. While not all samurai were tax collectors, it can be said that the vast majority, if not all tax collectors, would have hailed from the samurai class. Some historians believe that one of the reasons the rulers of Japan worked so hard over the years to turn the samurai into mythological heroes in the eyes of the people was to make it easier for them to do work like tax collecting without facing serious resistance from the commoners. Considering Japan at the time was an extremely class-based system and often had great unrest, this is a completely plausible theory. Number 5. Samurai men considered managing money beneath them it has always been a popular trope for the man to work all day in a sitcom and then come home and find out that his wife blew the money on dresses or something equally comedic. While these are played for cheap laughs, it's not uncommon for couples to have arguments about the budget, and often whichever person is the one making the majority of the money, whether it is the husband or the wife, usually argues that they should have most say in monetary decisions. These arguments often don't end well, as the other person often states what they contribute non-monetarily and how it is supposed to be an equal partnership. While we are all familiar with the dynamics of such an argument, it may surprise you that this was not only an argument that samurai had no desire to have with their wives, but in fact they had no desire to be the one dealing with money at all. Many samurai in early feudal Japan felt that dealing with money was beneath them, and would only handle it if it was part of their official duties. In this case, they still tried to avoid it by dealing with notes regarding the exchange instead of the actual money itself when possible. They left handling the money to their wives, who they believed should be suited to lower tasks such as managing the purse strings. While this may seem strange, it likely had practical origins. They probably convinced themselves it was beneath them because they didn't feel like they had the time, along with their other duties. Number 4. Many Samurai were deeply in debt to the emerging merchant class Samurai were always more of an important social class than just a group of elite warriors, and were usually not only well respected in society, but also quite wealthy, as those of a high class often are. However, the wealthy can often end up poor with the wrong decisions, and as the class-based system solidified, it only made things worse for the samurai warriors. It was during the Edo period that the government introduced a new and stricter class-based system. Samurai were the top class, and then there were those in agriculture, the artisans and the merchants. Some, who were of extremely noble birth, and certain criminals or other undesirables were considered outside this system. Samurai quickly found that despite their class and power, they had to rely on the townsfolk for financial deals. What this means is that the emerging merchant class quickly became successful, and the samurai found themselves in a situation where they needed to borrow money from the lower class in order to survive. While this may sound good for those merchants, it isn't always beneficial to loan money to those who may never pay you back. The samurai were part of the highest class order and very militaristic, which means that many loans were simply never repaid and the merchant had to take a huge loss. However, while they may not have always paid off their debts, this began a period where many samurai simply could no longer afford the luxuries they once did and had to start living simpler lifestyles. Number 3. Samurai Hakama Pants Were Probably Not Worn To Hide Footwork you may not have heard the term hakama pants before, but you have likely seen them in media many, many times. They are worn today by students of the discipline of kendo, the Japanese way of the sword, and are also seen prominently worn by samurai or those supposed to be like them in most movies, cartoons, or other depictions of feudal Japan. 
While they are worn as a matter of tradition in the martial art of kendo, the reason for why they were worn in ancient Japan has become somewhat misunderstood. Some people say it was to disguise a samurai's footwork, but this may have been little more than a fringe benefit that some people pointed out later. The fact is that these type of pants were originally designed for horse riding, and were once popular among women in Japan for that reason before they even became menswear. Even then, the evidence is that they were most popular for the comfort they provided while spending a long time on horseback, something many samurai most definitely had to deal with. There was also a special version of hakama pants with exceptionally long front and back legs, designed to create a trail kind of like a dress. Sometimes samurai would be forced to wear these when visiting an emperor or other important lord. The pants would make the samurai much less mobile, making the lord he was visiting feel safer. Number 2. They trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but it was a last resort. It's also important to talk about the samurai and how they approached hand-to-hand -hand combat in order to better understand how they fought as warriors. Today, the most popular export from Japan, apart from cutesy anime and manga, are the various types of martial arts that developed over the years. Perhaps because Westerners are so enthralled by martial arts, we forget that hand-to-hand -hand combat was not nearly as emphasized in their culture as we have led ourselves to believe. Just like their Western counterparts, the Japanese knew full well that weapons tended to be much more deadly and less risky to use initially than charging into battle with just your hands to fight. Despite this, many people still imagine samurai as having insane hand-to-hand -hand fighting skills, but it simply wasn't all that emphasized. Like all things that you should train in, they certainly developed techniques in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but many of the forms we know of today were not in existence or being seriously developed. The combat styles used by samurai were based on movements in full armor, which decreased their range of motion. Many of the holds were designed to get the opponent in position to use a small knife called a tanto on them as a finishing blow. In other words, even with their hand-to-hand -hand combat system, mixing it with weapons was emphasized. Samurai believed that you would end up in true hand-to-hand -hand combat in only the most desperate of circumstances, and emphasized skills that would avoid you getting in that situation in the first place. Number 1. The rivalry between ninja and samurai in popular legend is inaccurate. When many people think of ninjas, they think of people clad in all black with only their eye slits visible through their mask. We view them as stealthy assassins sneaking into guarded palaces at night and killing important inhabitants with a knife thrust or a quick dose of poison. This popular view of ninjas is very inaccurate and has given rise to people thinking of them as kind of the opposite of the samurai. They are usually believed to be from a much lower class and almost always viewed as the enemies of the samurai themselves. However, the truth is that the way of the ninja was essentially just another part of samurai warfare. Ninja were usually trained from families that were of fairly high class and usually for very specific traits, because it was a specialized warrior style. Ninjutsu itself was not specifically a style of hand-to-hand -hand combat, but would be better described as the training program used to teach warriors how to be stealthy and covert in general. Ninjas rarely wore all black and usually blended in to spy on their enemy emplacements or even pretended to be one of them for years. In other words, ninjas were not a special group of people who fought in the shadows against the samurai, they were simply another branch of the military in every feudal lord's bag of tricks. In many cases, those called samurai knew or were trained in many of the tricks of the ninja trade, and as such, there was a good bit of overlap. Many samurai were trained in stealth and doubled as ninjas when needed. The two types of warriors are not the separate warring factions that many people understand them to be. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do hit that like button below and don't forget to subscribe. Also over there on the right, a couple of other videos that you might enjoy if you enjoyed this one. And don't forget to leave us a comment below to let us know what you thought of this video. And thanks for watching.